um, Remus's friends and family that were also enslaved by the Graham family um, rebuttaled. They took the blood of an owl and sprinkled it on the chest, thereby cursing the chest so that anyone that used it afterwards would die. Uh, this is a wonderful Princess Anne home that was built about 1891 for uh, one of the, the local families that purchased a track of land from the Victoria Land Grant Company when this area was developed in the late 1880s. And uh, it was recently acquired by uh, Susan Shearer. When she got this place, it was, in, uh, it was in pretty bad shape. It had been divided up into apartments. And since she always had wanted a home with a fireplace, she came down here, found this uh, place, and. Uh, uh, invested no small amount of time and money into its uh, rehab and what we have today is uh, one of the nicest uh, charming homes here on 6th Street. Susan, like a lot of people, discovered that when she started her renovation she uh, disturbed uh, some spirits of former residents who lived here and uh, she'd like us to come inside and hear about her stories. I've had witnesses to just about everything that's happened, which is good. It kind of corroborates my, my story. And when things happen, you always look for the logical answer uh, until you can't find one. So then I write it down <laughs> on the list. But uh, I've, I've witnesses have just seen the most um, phenomenal things, such as water dripping from the ceiling when there's nothing up there except a dry ceiling. And um, that's pretty creepy. But I'm used to it. it. It things don't bother me anymore. It's just um, I don't. I hardly even notice. The Kentucky Historical Society has some really special objects with great stories of Kentuckians of note. But probably on the top of that list is a pocket watch that was owned by Abraham Lincoln. At the time the movie Lincoln was being created, we were actually approached by um, Skywalker Sound. They were searching out authentic sounds to go into the movie Lincoln. Spielberg sent a sound expert to the Kentucky Historical Society to record the ticking of Lincoln's actual watch. We had taken a lot of steps to make sure that the watch would not be harmed by winding it up. So prior to this sound expert arriving, our watch expert inspected the watch, made sure that it was in perfect order. I was there when our watch expert carefully wound the watch for the first time. And we sat there and listened to it tick for a little over a minute. And when it stopped, it stopped at 415, the month and the day that Abraham Lincoln died. When they were recording the sound for the movie, the watch was wound, they did the recording, and when it stopped, it stopped at 722, which is the hour and the minute Lincoln died. Certainly a lot of museums would be thrilled to have an iconic piece like this that belonged to Lincoln and we're so fortunate that we have it on display in our permanent gallery. Go through Old Louisville and you'll find elegant architecture and Victorian homes. The tree-lined streets are filled with century-old brick mansions with stained glass windows. But the story here is not about the exterior of these beautiful houses, it's about the strange and unexplained occurrences inside. David Dominey is a professor, tour guide, and author of the book, Ghosts of Old Louisville. On this Renovate Louisville, we'll take you behind closed doors to David's previous house as he relives firsthand some of the unusual happenings. But it turns out David is not alone when it comes to living in a haunted house. Other Old Louisville residents have similar tales that are both bizarre and chilling. Welcome to Louisville. This is one of the uh, largest historic preservation districts in the country. And as far as Victorian architecture goes, it's been said that we have the largest collection of Victorian mansions in the United States. Uh, we've got over a thousand homes down here, spread out over roughly 45 square blocks. 
when you take the uh, history of these wonderful mansions into consideration, you think about the families that have, uh, for generations, have lived, loved, and died behind these fortress-like walls, it's not surprising that some of these homes might have a, a couple ghosts knocking around. So uh, a lot of people who buy these wonderful old homes down here uh, tend to move in, and uh, it turns out they very often have uh, uh, unexpected tenants on their property. Uh, many people who renovate these old places sometimes are said to dig up spirits from the past, and I'm uh, one of these people who can uh, can talk about my own experience. I, uh, I lived in this place, the old Widmer house, uh, from 1999 to 2007. And one of the first things I did when I talked to the previous owner, uh, a woman by the name of Margaret, I asked if there are any ghosts or anything, just because I've always had a penchant for old homes and ghosts. And I was a little shocked when she said, uh, Yes, there's one. Her name's Lucy. And it turns out Lucy didn't like it when people change things around too much. So I had to find out the hard way. So let's go on inside and I'll show you some of the things uh, that I uncovered in the Widmer House. Okay, welcome to the Widmer House. This is a wonderful Chateauesque inspired townhome that was built about 1895 for a local man named Jacob Widmer. He was one of the uh, early tobacco barons in town and he had quite a bit of money so he was able to buy the state-of-the-art mansion uh, at a time when old Louisville was experiencing a lot of its growth down here. Um, he lived here for several years and he ended up moving out by the 1920s. A woman by the name of Sally Sevier bought the house. She had gone to see uh, the movie Lawrence of Arabia down at the uh, silent pictures downtown. She fell in love with Rudolph Valentino and uh, she noticed uh, all these wonderful arabesque details on the, the facade of the house and on the interior of the house. She came back and uh, painted it the uh, elaborate color scheme that we have it in nowadays and from that point forward it became known as the Moorish Palace. Now I uh, moved into the Moorish Palace as I said back in 1999 uh, having heard that there was a ghost here. I didn't believe the stories I heard but uh, uh, not too long after after I moved in, sure enough, strange things did start to happen. Uh, I was told that a poltergeist by the name of Lucy inhabited this place. And I was told that Lucy didn't like it when you change things around too much. So uh, I found out the hard way when I started to decorate and put up wallpaper and move things around. And sure enough, uh, two weeks later, strange things started to happen. Uh, it escalated to such a point that uh, a couple nights uh, in a six month period of time where there was a lot of activity here, I ended up leaving the house in the middle of the night. We later discovered uh, Lucy was a uh, former maid who used to work in the house and uh, uh, she had a little room at the back of the house and it turns out that was, uh, that was the part of the house where a lot of the activity uh, had taken place. Uh, we experienced activity uh, in the dining room and the kitchen as well, uh, all places where Lucy would have been most active. So that's what prompted me to start uh, exploring the haunted history of this wonderful neighborhood. And uh, little by little, I got to know the history of the homes down here. I got to meet the people moving in and renovating these old structures. And uh, uh, one by one, they came to me with uh, more and more interesting stories. And that's what led me to write The Ghosts of Old Louisville, uh, my first book. Or a year later, I wrote Phantoms of Old Louisville, a sequel, because it turns out so many people down here have stories of hauntings in these old homes. So uh, by the time I'm done, I'll have a series of five that detail the history of this neat old neighborhood. And it turns out uh, we're not only the largest Victorian neighborhood, uh, so it's said in the country, we're also the most haunted neighborhood as well. This is a handmade quilt. It is made of cotton and calico fabrics. It was made by Elizabeth Roseberry Mitchell in 1840. Three. And what this quilt depicts is uh, a basic quilt design, but if you look around the perimeter of the quilt, you're gonna see coffins. And these coffins, are they're made of cotton fabric, but there are paper labels on each one that signify um, one of Elizabeth's relatives. And if you move into the center of the quilt, you'll see that there is a path with a fence on either side, and in the center is a graveyard. And so what she used this quilt was a way to process her grief. But the, the piece is a great example of 19th century mourning customs tradition, acknowledging death and mortality and how real it was to these people. It wasn't going to a funeral home and that death to a certain extent now is disconnected from home. But for Elizabeth, this is something she's experiencing. She's seen two of her children pass away. And this quilt is an outlet for her to memorialize her children and also to acknowledge her own mortality. A quilt like this is extremely rare. We have nothing like it in the collection. I haven't seen anything else like this anywhere else. Rare, yes. And the subject might seem a bit odd today, 
but a great example from many days gone by of a mother capturing her family history with the storytelling device at hand, quilt making. Okay, now we're in front of a wonderful uh, red brick structure that was built in the 1890s for the, uh, the makers of Magnolia Ham, which was a popular uh, food product in uh, Louisville in the uh, latter part of the 1800s. Uh, people also call it the Bishop's Hat House. That's because of this uh, wonderful parapet that we can see that uh, mimics uh, a bishop's hat or a bishop's mitre. Uh, nowadays, uh, people know it for something else. This is the home of Happy Balls. That's the official candy of old Louisville. These are hand-rolled bourbon balls that are made by Ron and Jane Harris, the owners of the home and uh, the owners of the old Louisville uh, Candy Company, which is operated out of their uh, third floor on this uh, wonderful mansion. Now Ron and Jane are actors who came from New York City about four years ago and uh, they're another uh, couple who got a little more than they bargained for when they bought this wonderful old home. So let's go on inside and talk to Ron and Jane Harris, the uh, makers of Happy Balls. When we moved in and my husband went to the third floor back bedroom, the third floor is the servants quarters. In the back bedroom he would see this shadowy figure of a woman by the fireplace darning or sewing. And every time he'd go up, he'd see that. Until we opened the old Louisville Candy Company on the third floor and the back room became our storeroom. And there are boxes and everything we need to make candy in the back room. But the strange thing is, my husband and I didn't talk about this for about a year, but I'd put something on the table and it would be on the shelf. He'd put something on the floor and it would be on the shelf. Things kept moving around, but each of us thought the other one was moving them until he did something that just annoyed me. I said, why did you put that box on the floor when I had it on the table? He said, what are you talking about? And that's when we realized someone else was moving things around in that room. Okay, so here we are at the wonderful DuPont Mansion on South 4th Street. This is a wonderful Italian design building that was uh, constructed in the late 1800s. Before Herb and Gail Warren acquired it uh, uh, several years ago, this was, uh, this was a pretty rundown piece of property. Uh, the windows were broken out and people thought it was pretty much uh, condemned and slated for the wrecking ball uh, until Herb and Gail uh, put a lot of time and money into this and they restored it. And uh, today it's one of the most uh, uh, popular and opulent bed and breakfast that we have down here in Old Louisville. Uh, they've won quite a few preservation awards for all the wonderful work they've done on the inside. So we're going to go inside and uh, talk to Herb. He's going to tell us a little more about this place uh, because when this place was undergoing its uh, renovation and restoration, uh, there seemed to be a, a lecherous spirit that kept popping up. They say it was one of the uh, DuPonts uh, who originally built this mansion and uh, he had a pension for the ladies, they said. And back in uh, 1893 on May 16th, he was shot and killed by a, uh, a mistress uh, who became pregnant and uh, he refused to acknowledge the uh, child, and uh, so she uh, she got her revenge by shooting him on the steps of the old Galt house back then. And to this day, there have been ghostly reports of this uh, lecherous uh, DuPont in a, a black tuxedo with a gold tip walking stick and a gray silk top hat who likes to uh, haunt the stairwell. Uh, people who've uh, worked here, the designers and stuff, have uh, felt unpleasant gropes as they were going up the staircase and pinches and things like that. So it might be very, uh, true that the spirit of this uh, lecherous DuPont uh, lives on in the old uh, DuPont Mansion bed and breakfast. So let's go inside and see what Herb Warren has to tell us. Mr. DuPont uh, died a, a sudden, untimely, and, and uh, perhaps unsavory death. And uh, there were rumors uh, about him and his spirit circulating for many weeks and months after the death. One guest reported a feeling uh, in the room, a feeling around her that there was something there. Uh, and, and she awoke early in the morning, earlier than usual, looked up and, and saw a, a shape, uh, shook her husband, woke him up to show it to him, and it was gone. The story of this artifact begins about 1830. John Graham is uh, expecting a son. And in order to prepare for that, he wants to have a chest made. 
and he asks an enslaved man on his property uh, to, to create this chest. It's a beautiful mahogany veneered uh, chest of drawers with uh, acanthus leaves and beautiful Greek scroll work on the column. Uh, a beautiful chest, but for some reason, Graham did not like the chest, and he actually killed the enslaved man that had built the chest, a man named Remus. Um, Remus's friends and family that were also enslaved by the Graham family um, rebuttaled. They took the blood of an owl and sprinkled it on the chest, thereby cursing the chest so that anyone that used it afterwards would die. And the story continues on through 18 different deaths associated directly with the, the cursed chest. What we know about the chest came from Virginia Carey Hudson Cleveland as a precocious Victorian era child who loved to write down her grandmother's stories. Additional family generations carried the story forward, including the bizarre and lengthy ritual to break the curse. So we know about this, not only through the writings of Virginia Carey Hudson, but in the top drawer of the chest to this day, there is an owl feather and a little note that says it's to keep away the curse. So this, this story that had a very tragic uh, list of people that lost their lives as a result of it. Uh, Virginia wanted to, um, as she passed it down to her daughter, she wanted to keep it out of the hands of anyone else that could possibly accidentally put clothes in it. And so they um, donated it to the Kentucky Historical Society in 1976 in hopes that no one would ever place clothes in it again. So after all these years, it's been on display and uh, been stored here in our collection storage. Our staff is sure to make sure we never put anything in that chest of drawers. This is Paducah, Kentucky. Like many towns, people come and go, making it their home for a brief moment in time. Others, however, stay for much longer periods. In fact, they seem to linger long after death is taken. Speedy, for instance, was one Paducan who became a long-term resident. He was an itinerant who died here in 1928. Due to the enthusiastic embalmer and undertaker A.Z. Hammock, he remained firmly above ground until 1994, 66 years after his death, when he was finally buried with all the pomp and ceremony due a dearly loved town mascot, and his grave has become an attraction in Paducah. But perhaps the strangest story is of the ghost of Stella Cohn, who even put in an appearance for us, right on cue. C.C. Cohen's is a popular place to visit here in town. It offers the same things as many other taverns. Fine food, good atmosphere, and plenty of spirits. But they're not all in shot glasses. I have been down on 2nd Street late at night, sometimes working on exhibits till 2 o'clock in the morning. And when you leave the museum, uh, which is right across from Cohen's at two o'clock in the morning. You look over here at these upper windows on the building. It's kind of scary sometimes looking over here. I can see where, where a ghost would be right at home. I never really believed in ghosts till I saw one. I believe in spirits first off anyway. I do believe that Stella does still inhabit this place. Stella Cohen lived on this property for most of her life. She was brought here by her father, Abe, who opened a business selling clothes, hats, and shoes. He also ran his own loan office and pawn shop. Stella grew up above the shop on the second floor. She eventually married Ben Piney and moved into a new home with her young husband, where they spent many happy years, until the ghastly day when he was murdered, and Stella, now a grieving widow, moved back into her family home. She worked in the business with her sisters, and together they grew older and more eccentric. The first time I saw the Cohen sisters uh, as a child, uh, they were very eccentric ladies, uh, very old, very um, guarded. They would not speak to anyone they did not know. Uh, they were courteous, but uh, they were very secretive. They dressed um, in a contemporary fashion for the time, but uh, they were very odd in their makeup. They would have bright rouge and, and lipstick smeared, and, and uh, uh, they just uh, looked very eccentric. When Stella died, her mortal remains were reunited with the rest of her family but her ghostly presence is very much above ground. The home was sold, and as construction began to turn it into a restaurant, strange things started happening. Then when the 
demolition and reconstruction was done on the restaurant on all three floors, the uh, the workmen then would they'd lose their tools. Their their tools wouldn't stay plugged into the walls. They uh, they just had all kinds of little events, no mishaps and nothing malicious, but they they talked about Stella. Bartender at the time, Steve Servant, a uh, friend of mine, he had finished, uh, everything was cleaned up, general public was all, uh, there was no one here. And uh, he came around and sat down beside me at the bar and we were talking to each other. And from the front door, uh, the main entry to the restaurant, uh, we saw a dark figure. She walked across the room between tables, came up uh, a short flight of stairs behind us, and we turned to look to see who it was, and there was no one there. Other employees of C.C. Cohen's have met Stella several times and just treat her as one of the regulars. The first thing that I had with Stella was I was working a banquet up here one evening and the windows, the, the sun was coming in through the windows casting shadows on the opposite wall. And I saw a lady, I saw the shadow of a lady go all the way across the wall. And I assumed it was one of the other servers that was up here with me. So I turned around to look and I was the only one up here. Sometimes I always feel reminded if I'm by myself coming around up here to say, hello, Stella, or how you doing? You know, maybe just so she won't bother me or anything. Along with the daily specials, new employees learn the legend of Stella. Perhaps so they don't panic when they encounter the flickering lights, the flying dishes, falling trays, and moving chairs. Stella has been seen gliding across the dance floor, peering down from the window, watching the diners from upstairs, or sitting at the end of the bar. As we were filming this story, Stella decided to put in a dramatic appearance. Mary Hammond had a spine-chilling encounter while she was waiting to be interviewed. I sat over to the side and listened to Penny Fields tell her story, and she was talking about Stella Cohen, and all of a sudden, my leg, and up my thigh, and my forearm, and even up on my, my cheekbones, it just gave me a chill. <laughs> just a really strange feeling. I don't think I've quite felt that before. A stunned Mary was apparently touched by Stella, who, it seems, just can't leave her old Kentucky home. The Kentucky Historical Society has a number of objects and artifacts that really help us tell important stories about the American Civil War. And one of our artifacts, in addition to telling important stories, uh, also has a, a fun legend attached to it as well. In July 1864, near Marietta, Georgia, Joseph Dudley and other members of the 16th Kentucky Infantry Regiment were camped outside of that town. And Dudley was probably getting ready to go to sleep. A number of his comrades would have been in there. And that night, as they drifted off to sleep, this terrible thunderstorm rolled in. And unfortunately for Dudley, there was a crack of thunder and a tree actually fell over on the tent, crushing Dudley and killing him instantly. Despite this, it's very miraculous that the cornet that the Kentucky Historical Society now has um, actually remained uh, unscathed in this accident. And today, one legend holds that if anyone were to play that cornet, that another terrible thunderstorm would blow in wreaking havoc. Of course, no one at the Kentucky Historical Society has put the haunted coronet to the test, but the legend does make for an interesting twist on a tragic Civil War story. It's a great legend that we have here as part of this object, but more importantly, this important artifact helps us tell stories about common soldiers during the Civil War and lets us interpret the fact that even though there were terrible battles that were raging, most soldiers ended up dying from either disease or illness or accidents during the Civil War. Well, the Octagon Hall is known for its age. It's a very unique structure, an eight-sided structure, uh, antebellum, built prior to the Civil War, finished about 1859. Because of its importance during the war as they looked out, uh, used as a hospital by Mr. Caldwell, a Confederate sympathizer. We have picked up an extreme amount of paranormal activity in the house. Everything from apparitions, which I will mention a few. We've uh, had one that uh, appeared at two o'clock in the afternoon, which appears to be a soldier uh, in the driveway. Uh, we have a image of a little girl caught on a photograph from the upstairs window out in the front yard. Everything around her is in perfect focus, except her body and it's very translucent. We have an apparition that we captured in the basement 
We uh, were with a team that went into the basement at uh, two in the morning and the cameras all started fuzzing up and we what appears to be a decomposing corpse laying on the, the ground at the bottom of the steps. We've also picked up the apparitions of a soldier walking across or leaning against a tree rather in the backyard uh, beside the uh, summer kitchen. The Octagon Hall is known for its EVPs. Uh, each team, and we've had over 150 investigative teams here, have picked up at least one, many, multiple dozens of EVPs. Some that are really very clear. Uh, we have a young girl, which we think is Mary Elizabeth, the resident young lady that died in the fire in the basement saying mommy she's also asking will you play with me she also has said i see you and we we think it's her that we catch very very often just singing along when you come into the house in the mornings going la 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 or humming we often pick up whistles and again, there's just so many, many different things that have happened in the house and continue to happen to this day. The house, as I said, not only uh, is a mecca for uh, paranormal activity, but the yard, the farm, the barns, all the outbuildings are period structures that were here. And we actually have a train bell that came from where the Confederates derailed a train on the back of the property in 1864. So all of these objects that are here are drawing, we think, this paranormal energy and holding it that we can pick up later at different times. The back of the property, uh, the Caldwell Farm actually fronted the uh, l and Railroad, the, that was finished also at the same time the house was in 1859 and used extensively by the uh, Union forces more than the Confederate. And this area was predominantly guerrilla activity. The uh, guerrillas attacked the train in 1864. They uh, derailed the train, burned it, and we think that the Caldwells actually took the bell off the locomotive and brought it up to the house and put it on a post and made a dinner bell out of it. We picked up a lot of varied activity on the property because the, ho the house and the grounds were used as a campground when the Confederates evacuated Bowling Green, which is about 10 miles north of us, early in the wars in February of 1862. They camped on the grounds for a couple of days and evacuated, which eventually led into Shiloh. But the biggest problem was that directly behind them was the Union forces, and they stayed for two or three days. Uh, they didn't treat the Caldwells with, uh, with great love. They, according to records, burned some of the buildings outside. They killed their cattle for food, and as just a pure act of meanness, killed the milk cow and threw it into the well thereby contaminating the water so that they actually had to go to the creek to get water for a month. We also have a slave cemetery, uh, which is a circle of bald cypress trees. Uh, the Caldwells were slave owners. They had 25 slaves at the end of the war between the states. And they considered their slaves as part of the family and they were willing to build a circular tree burial site uh, cemetery. We, we know that there are 17 graves there. Uh, the, the, they're only marked with field stones. And outside of that circle of trees are two Confederate soldiers that died in the house during the war. We know of one that made it to the house and was hiding from the Union Army. They hid him in the attic 
And as the Union soldiers searched for him, apparently he took his boot off and was wounded in the leg and released the pressure on the artery. And he bled to death when they went up to get him. He'd already passed away. Another Confederate soldier was found early one morning about daylight on the front steps. And we think that he made it to the house. We don't know if he was unable or too weak to knock on the door, or if he did, the family didn't hear him. But when they got up the next morning, he was deceased. And he's also buried at the outside of the slave cemetery. They're, they're both marked with unknown soldiers' uh, gravestones. Well, again, I can't believe that I'm sitting here in this house at nine o'clock at night because I hate this place and I've been terrified of it for a long, long time. I've never really known for sure what to believe, uh, whether I want to believe that it's real or uh, just figments of people's imagination. But there's been too many instances and, and too many uh, things happen that make me realize that I have to believe it. Um, I finally came in one evening when my husband was here and uh, while we were in the house and it was quiet, I felt something behind me flipping my hair. And at first I just moved it myself a few times thinking it was air, but then it was very obvious that someone was playing with my hair and there was no one behind me. And that's happened several times. Um, recently, I did hear the singing. I was singing as we walked through the house, and then when I stopped singing, I could hear um, the sound, the faint sound of someone singing or humming, and it was coming from the upstairs. I walked over to the staircase, and it stopped. And then as I walked back away from the staircase, it began again and it sounded like a little girl uh, humming or, or um, singing very, very low. And then I could hear her a little bit more prominently. And my husband heard it too. And he had told me that they hear her singing a lot, Mary Elizabeth. And so that was my first, um, I guess, witness of that. Being the... Uh director of, of the property, uh, when I come in in the mornings, of course, we have an alarm system on the property. Uh, this, these things happen very, very occasionally. We uh, have the uh, alarm. Uh, once it's deactivated, we've picked up footsteps, walking around on the floors upstairs. We've actually heard doors open and close. Uh, singing. The little girl loves to do her little singing and humming and footsteps. The, uh, the entire house sometimes, uh, and, and it's not every day, but it does come alive. And uh, one of the, probably the scariest thing that has happened to me, and this is going to take some time, so I'll... <laughs> but it, but, cut it down. Yeah, but it's, but it's a great story. Okay. Uh, we received a photograph of the little girl, Mary Elizabeth's mother, that was found in a trunk in Logan County, Kentucky, with her name on the back of it. Didn't Had no clue that it even existed. Uh, the individual sent it to us, and we were thrilled, of course, and it was just a small tin type, and we checked it and had it blown up to a 16 by 20, put it into a antique frame, uh, on a Wednesday morning, no one was around. I was here alone. Took it upstairs and hung it on the wall in the bedroom. And as I started down the steps, I heard a young girl's voice just basically say, Mommy, just like she recognized the photograph. And I'll admit it, I went down the steps very quickly. <laughs> Mary Elizabeth was the daughter of Andrew Jackson Caldwell and his first wife, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, she was seven years old. Her and her cousin were playing in the fireplace in the basement. Uh, and as children do, apparently she got too close to the fire 
and either an ember popped out onto her dress or uh, she got her, her dress into the fire and it ignited it. Uh, it was fatal to her. She uh, passed away. We don't know whether it was immediate or whether she lingered a few days. My best guess would be that she lingered for a few days. Uh, and because of that, we, uh, we see her. I've actually seen her twice in the basement. Uh, the first time I saw her, she appeared to be solid. And I thought it was actually some small child that had come in with a tour and, and walked into the basement. And I uh, said, can I help you? And she started to turn and her, I could see then that uh, it wasn't quite solid. It started to fade away and just dissipated right in front of my eyes. Uh, the second time I saw her, I knew immediately that, that she was not a human solid. Uh, she was very translucent, and she was walking away from me. One of our investigators was here uh, late at night and had one of probably the most traumatic experiences of his career. He had been downstairs and heard the footsteps going across the floor upstairs. In fact, he told me that it was so loud that he thought someone had actually broken into the house and it was a human being walking around upstairs. So he went up the stairs and more or less confronted the dark room and said, okay, who's up here? And there was just enough ambient light coming in the front window that he could see the shape of this seven foot shadow figure. And it actually charged him and came right up against him, even almost appeared to come into him. Uh, you'd, you'd have to know this individual. He's uh, a very strong type of individual. He went down almost on his knees, took his breath, uh, nauseous. He thought he was actually having uh, chest pains of some kind of coronary. Uh, and then probably the first time in his career, he actually had to bolt outside to get his wits back about him and he, he actually told me he was almost afraid to come back in the house he's just ready to leave his equipment and not even not even come back in and the same situation happened a week later with another member of that same team and this time he got a really good look at it and he had a chance to uh, compare it to the size of the door frame and our door frames are eight foot tall and he said there was about six inches between the top of his head and the top of the frame. And it also charged him. Uh, I think he retreated quicker than the first investigator did. So he didn't have all of the ill effects, but uh, it, it was one of the most traumatic things that has ever happened. We've also picked that same figure up in a photograph in the basement. Uh, very cold day in February, two in the morning. And the photographer set up a tripod, taking 10 second shots, took five shots and this uh, apparition, for lack of a better term, I call it the shadow man, appeared to peer out of the basement window directly at watching them sitting in the driveway taking the photograph. We've had over and over again times that my wife and I would come by the house after going to a movie or going out to dinner, uh, leave one of our vehicles here and come back and get it. The house totally black at night, uh, start down the driveway and many of our lights are on motion sensors uh, to help facilitate the tours. And as we drive down the driveway, every light in the house will come on. Uh, just like they're walking through the house, turning the lights on to watch us. She's also been here with me a few times and had her hair touched. And just recently we were uh, in the house sitting uh, in, in the quiet and she had been singing a song, kind of walking through the house and she stopped abruptly and immediately we could, someone was finishing the song upstairs with their humming and and trying to follow the same tune. Uh, we've had many, many times, we do have the alarm system here. Uh, 
thank goodness they're they're trying to be a little more uh, lenient toward us uh, there for a few months when we first took over the property in 2001 and installed the alarm system in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning i get a call from the police officers that uh, the house had an alarm going off and i would have to get out of bed and come out here and there's a door in our dining room that would be standing wide open they had been latched for two or three days and never really opened and then suddenly it's standing wide open at two in the morning to be honest with you i got pretty well fed up with it and one night i said okay that's enough i'm not coming out here anymore and it hasn't occurred since so maybe i talked them out of it i have um we've had very very many phone calls from uh, the alarm company in, that in the middle of the night and normally when the phone starts ringing in the middle of the night you automatically think something terrible is wrong and for us it's just become uh, the norm and we automatically think well the ghosts are moving again and um, I do know that the sheriff's uh, deputies um, have become very reluctant to come in the house before my husband does and um, They've, they've become pretty frightened. And what's interesting is most of the time, um, the motion sensor that is uh, tripped will be in the center of the house. And uh, there's no way if someone had broken in that they could just trip that one uh, sensor because they would have to have tripped others to get to that point. So there are, um, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's, um, uh, what is causing it? Uh, I don't know why the, the uh, spirits are here, but they are definitely here and, and they're everywhere. Um, I don't know if it's the, I've heard it said that it's the shape of the house, the eight-sided shapes that help create uh, an energy field that, uh, that brings them here. I don't know if that is true, but I do know that the majority of the ghost hunters and the investigative teams that have been here um, the majority and I and I would say most of them have have come away with evidence either EVPs or um, actual apparitions and sightings uh, uh, there have been several occasions where we have uh, left a vehicle here and uh, come back late in the evening or late at night to uh, pick it up and as we're driving away of course, all of the house, uh, the lights are on motion sensors for the tours. And uh, as we are driving out of the driveway, I've looked back and, and seen different lights coming on inside the house. Knowing no one is inside, there, there can only be one thing that's causing that. Uh, we, were here, um, we were here several weeks ago, uh, and I saw a shadow moving uh, across the upstairs. Uh, the group of people that I was with at the time uh, had, uh, I thought, had gone upstairs and uh, that they were the reason for the shadow. But when I turned to see if they had gone upstairs, they were actually standing behind me in, in the room behind me. So there was no one upstairs. But as I looked, several of the others that I was with saw the same thing and uh, there was there was nothing that actually could have um, legitimately caused that. Well, Lisa nailed it. This is a macabre menagerie of items up here. We're back in museum storage at the Kentucky Historical Society. And we want to introduce you to Jessica Stavro. She's our deputy director here at KHS. And she's going to walk us through some of these items now, there's definitely a creepy vibe going on. This That's is the, safe, correct? Yeah, this is the creepy corner of okay. the collection. Now, we rely on information to come up with interpretation and ideas of how history happened, but sometimes we don't have the information and some things are just plain creepy. So we'll start with Clara McBride's hair. Okay. Clara McBride was a Kentuckian and uh, like many women in the early 20th century, she had very long auburn hair mm. and 1920 came along and 
she decided oh, to bob it off. Time for Bob. Yeah, so this is the hair that she kept in okay. a cigar box oh. um, in our collection. So imagine opening up a cigar box and finding a box right. of hair. And, and it's uh, beautifully preserved, I must say. And in the 19th and early 20th centuries, hair was one of those things that people really held on to, to connect themselves to another person, whether they be deceased, This for could example. be cherished by a, by a family member. Absolutely. Also cherished by families for generations oh. is this portrait we have. Look at this, this is gentleman. A, his name was Colonel Blackburn. He was born in the 1780s and lived until after the Civil War. So he was about 80 years old. But as you notice, he's only got one he's eye. Got one eye going here. Now we don't know how he lost his eye. But again, imagine that house where this is hanging in the hallway and the right. candles flicker at night. Yes. The, the creepiest element of all is really drawing me in here. Introduce us to this gentleman, Jessica. This is the Jimmy doll. Jimmy now, doll. His eyes are a little glass or, or plastic cover and they have a little filament in them. So it looks like the wow. eyes used to light up. Wow. Now Jimmy doll was won by a little boy. He was 12 years old. This is about 1910. He won it at a carnival in Cynthiana, Kentucky. His okay. name was Hammy. Now, Hammy and his two brothers all fought in World War I. Wow. Hammy's mother held on to the doll to kind of keep the boys safe while they were at war. Not only did all three boys serve in World War I, but they were all registered for the draft in World War II. Mm. And we did find a record of all three of them after World War II. Wow. Again, this is a loving tribute to Kentuckians who serve. Absolutely. But today, uh, a little, a little scary <laughs> now, as he, it lives here in our archive. The, the mother put a World War I uniform on him. So it kind of makes it like a talisman or a lucky charm. Right. We are superstitious or maybe a little stitious as people. <laughs> But this, these really speak to the power of objects and the meaning that people give to them. Well, thank you, Jessica, for a little creepy with context. Haunted Historic Kentucky returns after this. They say Old Louisville is America's most haunted neighborhood, and it's come to be a nickname that the uh, residents here have come to embrace. People are very proud of their haunted houses down here. And it's a, it's a self-proclaimed kind of title. Um, it came from the books I wrote about the neighborhood. No one rivals Old Louisville for being uh, the most haunted neighborhood in the country. And it's not surprising because I myself have investigated or researched over 100 uh, professed cases of haunting down here. One of the places is the Conrad Caldwell House, which is said to be one of the neighborhood's most haunted mansions. The mansion was built by Theophilus Conrad. The Conrad Caldwell House sits on the original site of the Southern Exposition on St. James Court, which is one of the first neighborhoods in the country. The Conrad family lived here first from about 1895 until about 1905. He actually emigrated from Alsace-Lorraine um, to Louisville, where some of his family was. Um, he started off with a small tannery and he kept buying more businesses. He uh, arrived in Louisville as a young man in the mid 1800s. He had $2 in his pocket. They said he had just finished his apprenticeship as a leather tanner in France. And he made his way to Louisville and took that $2 and turned it into an empire. By the end of that century, he was one of the wealthiest men in the city. And this house was built as his retirement home. It cost about $75,000, which with conversion rates we've been able to figure out was close to a million dollars. Um, so this was a an advanced, um, beautifully constructed home um, in the late 19th century. We have at least 120 fleur-de-lis on the first floor that we've been able to count. Um, you know, a, a throwback to the time that Mr. Conrad lived in, in France. We have a lot of unique features about the house, a number of of things. Um, we have a chandelier in the library that Mrs. Caldwell had created after a chandelier in a, a home in Europe that she saw that she really liked. Um, we also have a fireplace in the middle of the house, which a lot of people would question. Um, the flue actually is designed so that it kind of leaves sideways and goes up um, a, a flue in the middle of the house. Um, so that's very unique. He spent the last 10 years of his life in the house. One day in 1905, he was going up the back stairs and collapsed of a heart attack and died. 
and we believe he laid in state in this room that we're sitting in, which is the parlor. So there's a chance that, you know, he, he still wants to make sure that our home is, is taken care of and that we're doing everything we can to keep the doors open and keep people interested. His wife, after she buried him, didn't want to stay on in the big house all by herself. So she sold it to some friends, uh, the Caldwell family. And then William Caldwell purchased it in 1905. William Caldwell is best known as the owner of the um, W.E. Caldwell Company, which is now known as the Caldwell Tank Company. They were very wealthy, um, and it is very evident by just the attention to detail in this home. He and his wife spent about two years uh, rehabbing the house or, or modernizing the home. Um, Mrs. Caldwell had spent some time in Europe and wanted everything to be the top of the line. So they lived in the house for about 40 years. And then um, it became the Rosanna Hughes home for uh, Presbyterian widows. And so they maintained the home from sometime in the 40s until 1987, when the St. James Court Historic Foundation purchased the home to turn it into a museum. There are a number of people who died in the house. Not surprising that there are a number of ghosts who are said to haunt this place today. Uh, one of them seems to be Mr. Conrad himself. Uh, they say when people go into the house for the regular tours that are offered, um, people who are, I guess, like me, nosy and sneak off and want to open doors and drawers and things like that and uh, see what they can find, those are the ones that have the encounters with Mr. Conrad. They say he's a very short man. He uh, sort of appears as a misty apparition and it takes the shape of a man with a goatee and a bowler hat. And he never says anything to anyone. He just shows up and sternly looks at them and does this as if to say, you shouldn't be doing this. And then he disappears. And uh, throughout the last years, there have been lots of people who have reported this apparition, just one of many apparitions that uh, are supposedly uh, afoot. So one of our docents believes that there are three women from the Rosanna Hughes Presbyterian home that still inhabit their old room on the second floor, which is the sitting room. Um, if we move things, they tend to get a little upset. Um, and so they'll open doors or move things as well. Um, so we've had that instance. And one of our docents will um, say hello to them in the morning just to make sure that she, you know, has, has talked to them. Sometimes I think there's a ghost whenever the, ele the elevator goes up because it's a huge noise right in my office and it startles me. My first experience with ghosts here was I was giving a tour on the third floor and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a ball of light go flying by. And I probably wouldn't have thought anything about it, but then a second one went back. So I thought that maybe the people in my group were swinging purses or umbrellas, but I turned around, they were all just standing there. And many people have had other experiences here. I once had a lady who came through for a tour and she asked to see the piano in one of the rooms. And as we were walking through, she said, do you have spirits here? And I said, yes, I think we probably do. She said, there is a lady standing right behind you. She's wearing an ivory dress. She has her arms out like she's encompassing the whole house. One time I was on the second floor and I saw a gray shadow figure go darting across. I thought it was our assistant director and I came down and asked her why she was in the middle of my tour. She said, I wasn't there. We had a housekeeper here in the house and apparently it was raining outside. She was the only one here. She heard a voice start saying, hurry, hurry, close the windows. It's raining outside. She went upstairs. The window was open. It was raining in. I love when people walk in and just exclaim, they're like, wow, this is such a beautiful place. Um, you know, getting to work with the volunteers who are excited to be here every day and to tell the stories that we do. You know, just making an impact and trying to keep history alive. It's Hi, my name is Bridget Stryker. I'm the local history coordinator with the Boone County Public Library. Welcome to the Gaines Tavern. The Gaines Tavern was built in 1812 for Abner Gaines. Over the years, it was a tavern, it was a home, it was an antique shop. But since 1899, it's been most well known 
for its murders and suicides within this house and how it was cursed and haunted. In the 1889 Boone County Recorder, I found a whole article talking about nine murders and suicides that happened within this house and on this property. That is almost a murder or suicide every five or six years. Right now, the tavern is not open to the public and you're not able to get onto the property to see the house. So this is our opportunity to share some of these stories with you. There were two suicides by gunshot in the house while it was still a tavern. Uh, along this route, this road used to be the main highway between Lexington and Cincinnati. There weren't a whole lot of stagecoach routes through this area. So this was the last stop before you got into Covington and Cincinnati. The former mayor of Covington, he came here, he played cards with the rest of the members who stayed here overnight. After the card game, he went upstairs and people heard a gunshot and they ran upstairs and he was kneeling in front of his bed and he had his, the gun on the bed and he managed to pull the trigger with his cane. So you can imagine the reputation that sometimes houses and taverns like this had when all of a sudden you had deaths surrounding the house. During our ghost walks, sometimes we have things that happen during the ghost walk. When people are in the building, their cell phones malfunction. Either they'll go through the house and they won't get any of their text messages until they come outside. Sometimes they'll malfunction if they're trying to record on their phone in the house. And sometimes when they take photographs of the outside of the house, they'll see images. The last time we did a tour here for the public and we were outside, one of my staff was standing in the side yard talking about some of the tragedies that happened out on the side yard and people were taking photos of the windows on the second floor that was dimly lit. Those photographs showed an older man with a little girl standing in a window. We didn't have any older gentlemen um, on staff or in the building at the time and we didn't have any little girls in the building. Around the time that I was researching that, the house was open for museum visits and there was a teen girl in the front living room, the front parlor, playing on an instrument like an organ. A woman came up to the door, uh, addressed the teen docent who was in, in the room and said, just so you know, the little girl likes it when you play the concertina. And there had been no little girl guests that day the volunteer had not been playing the instrument for at least an hour before the woman had come onto the property. And it was at that same time that I discovered that a little girl had uh, passed away in the family and was buried in the cemetery um, right nearby. We've researched who the little girl might be and we think it is Abner Gaines's young daughter who died in 1822. So thanks for joining me today to talk about the Gaines Tavern and the spooky things that have happened in its history. Boone County history can be pretty creepy and weird sometimes, but that's how we like it. Hey, welcome back to Haunted Historic Kentucky here at the Kentucky Historical Society. We have Dana Zinger with us from the KHS staff. We're back in museum storage and Dana, you've uh, continued our macabre menagerie of uh -huh. items here. Walk me through this. What, what do we have going on here? Okay. So these two arrived together. The beaded necklace was in this sewing kit and it arrived anonymously here in the year 2000. So we don't know who donated this. Really? Item. Okay. But whoever it was probably just wanted to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, two prominent Kentuckians back in the 1820s were betrothed and the attentions and the charms of a lady uh -oh. took the man away. Uh -oh. And yes, okay. so the jilted lover made these beads. I can actually see some writing yes. on there. So, read, read for us what's on these on okay. these cursed beads. Yet go thou base deserter, go and if some happier dame has kindled in thy breast the glow of love's deceitful flame. Wow. So she was not she was a little happy. upset. Yeah. Yeah. Upset. So the jilted lover gave the beads to her ex fiance mm -hmm. and his new wife liked the beads, so she put them on and died within a year. Wow. So and then every thirteen years after that something bad would happen to this gentleman until he died. Until he so, passed away. So, 
supposedly the next person that received it every 13 years. Wow. Okay, definitely, definitely creepy. Now, what about this uh, this ring beside it here? Okay. So this ring belonged to John Rowan, who was a very prominent Kentuckian. John Rowan and Dr. James Chambers, both prominent residents of Bardstown, both of them under the age of 30, they were young, um, were at a tavern drinking one night and things got heated. Mm. And then after that, Dr. James Chambers called out John Rowan to a duel. This was February 3rd, 1801. They actually dueled. Um, and this happened just right outside of Bardstown. Um, they dueled and Dr. Chambers was fatally shot. The ring actually contains a tidbit of Dr. Chambers' hair. And so Rowan apparently had that fashioned into a ring and wore that. Uh -huh. Kind not, of as a little trophy. Not creepy at all. So. Dana, thanks so much for sharing these stories. And if you want to request these items to do some research, or if you just want to view them online, visit history.ky.gov. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.